The random and senseless murder of Jeanette Collins sent a wave of fear and outrage for the peaceful seaside community of Pacific Beach, California. The investigation into her death would lead to a nationwide dragnet for a sexual predator, a heartless killer who perceived a woman's rejection as an invitation to murder. I'm Brian Dennehy, and this is Arrest and Trial. With a combined 35 years in law enforcement, San Diego homicide detective Richard Twing and investigator Bill Green have helped to put dozens of murderers and violent criminals behind bars. But their expertise was put to the ultimate test when a sex murderer began randomly preying on the innocent. Just before noon, homicide detectives arrived at the apartment of 24-year-old Jeanette Collins. We got there and we were uh, briefed by the patrol officers who were originally dispatched, and they told us what they had found. Who discovered the body? Her two roommates. They're outside talking to the officer. Once we the deceased lying in the closet, and what appeared to be drag marks on the carpeting. Uh, it appeared that she'd been killed on the bed and then placed in the closet. She had been uh, in that position where she was placed for some time. There was uh, post-mortem lividity was evident. Collins, a part-time receptionist, had been strangled to death and then buried beneath a pile of dirty laundry. She was strangled uh, using a ligature. Uh, we believed it to be pantyhose. Crime scene technicians and investigators conducted an exhaustive search of the apartment, looking for any clue that might lead to Jeanette Cullen's killer. Well, the apartment was somewhat uh, in disarray. However, it wasn't really what we found at the apartment that was important to us. It was what we didn't find. We didn't find her wallet and her car keys or any identification. Some of her closest personal property just wasn't there. It wasn't long before the missing items produced a critical break in the case. We knew that she'd been uh, killed on the 12th. Her bank card had been used at an ATM on the 13th. So we contacted the bank and found that they had the transaction on video from that particular ATM. Check this out. There was a night when the suspect was waiting for the transaction to be processed, he lit a cigarette, and the match was as good as a flashbulb. Armed with a photo from the ATM, Detective Twain re-interviewed Jeanette Cullen's roommate. She immediately recognized the man as someone who had been hounding Jeanette for a date. Dean Carter. He's this total creep who kept coming around and bothering Jeanette. She couldn't even stand the guy. She said he started frequenting some of the local bars where young uh, single females like to frequent. And they was there at one of these bars in Pacific Beach that he met our victim. The roommate told detectives that Dean Carter had made a surprise appearance outside the apartment just moments before she discovered Jeanette Cullen's body. Carter had been to the apartment and showed up unexpectedly. Hey, you seen Jeanette? No, Dean, I haven't seen her. Why? Well, we had a date last night. She never showed up. Well, I don't know what to tell you. Well, if you see her, tell her I don't like being stood up. The roommate provided a detailed description of the car Carter was driving and its vanity license plate, Phantom Z. A routine check of the plates led to a disturbing discovery. Behind me is the apartment complex that two days ago was the scene of a gruesome double murder that has residents in this quiet Culver City neighborhood terrified. Roommates Susan Knoll and Gillette Mills were found raped and strangled. The killer left his victims stacked neatly on top of one another in a hallway closet. According to police sources, the killer may be driving one of the victim's cars, a 280Z. After discovering ladies were all deceased in the same manner. We 
could clearly see that Dean Carter was a vicious sexual predator. A sadistic serial killer was on the loose. Time was of the essence. An interstate all points bulletin was issued. Teletype I put together listed a very good description of the vehicle and uh, his name and approximate age and height and weight, and that we wanted him detained for questioning. Detectives thoroughly investigated every possible lead, hoping that they could find Dean Philip Carter before he killed again. Despite an all points bulletin and nationwide dragnet, Dean Philip Carter had managed to elude capture. But Carter's luck was about to run out. As their investigation widened, detectives learned that the murders of Jeanette Collins, Gillette Mills, and Susan Canole were just the tip of the iceberg. Carter was also wanted in connection with two other attacks, a sadistic five and a half hour rape of a Ventura woman and a brutal sexual assault of a San Diego housewife. We discovered that uh, Mr. Carter had been a, a very busy man in a, in a five day period. Investigators had no doubt that Dean Philip Carter would kill again. The only question was when and where. The teletype San Diego authorities issued paid off when an Arizona state trooper spotted a Nissan 280Z driving erratically just outside of Phoenix. I've got a 280Z, I'm pulling over California plates, Phantom Z, P-H-N-T-H-M-Z. As a general rule, when an officer stops a car from out of state, he runs the plate and uh, my teletype was in the system asking that the driver of the vehicle be detained and that uh, there was a homicide in San Diego involved. Can I see your driver's license, sir? Dean Philip Carter was arrested on the spot. What did I do, officer? To the trooper, he seemed perfectly normal, with one odd exception. Carter was wearing a woman's sweater. When he was arrested, there was a tremendous amount of evidence tying him to these murders. He had our victim's ID and her uh, bank pass card in his possession. He had what we believe was the murder weapon in his pocket, which was a um, knee-length stocking. A search of the stolen 280Z uncovered even more incriminating evidence. Jeanette's missing gym bag with her identification tag is found in the car. A piece of paper with the name of Sue Noel on it. But several of the items found in the car did not belong to any of the three murder victims. In the glove compartment, police found a checkbook belonging to a West Los Angeles woman named Bonnie Guthrie. In the back seat, they found a set of car keys that were traced to Tok Chum Kim, an Oakland computer programmer. When investigators ran the two names through the police database, their worst fears were realized. Both women were dead, victims of strangulation. Dean Philip Carter had struck again. The body count now stood at five. The Jeanette Collins murder case landed on the desk of San Diego Deputy District Attorney Jim Pippin, a seasoned prosecutor with 568 felony convictions to his credit. Time this series of murders occurred, the law in California was that jurisdiction for each murder was in the county that the murder occurred in. And that meant that the Oakland murder had to be tried in Oakland. The Los Angeles County murders had to be tried in Los Angeles. And the San Diego murder had to be tried in San Diego. Pippin knew it would be years before he would get his shot at Dean Philip Carter, and time was his enemy. Investigators gathered signed statements from witnesses to ensure that their case against Carter would stand the test of time. We went out and re-interviewed every single witness that the police had interviewed. We also wanted to make a personal contact with each witness so when the phone calls came, maybe years later, they would know who they were talking to. And as it turned out, that was a huge help for us because it was uh, 
six and a half years later before we got a chance to put him on trial. After a seemingly endless number of procedural delays and gratuitous legal maneuvers, serial killer Dean Philip Carter was finally going to stand trial before a jury. For Deputy District Attorney Jim Pippen, it was his long-awaited chance to avenge the deaths not only of Jeanette Collins, but of every victim Carter had claimed. Jim Pippen launched the prosecution's case with a detailed timeline of Dean Philip Carter's trail of terror. Dean Philip Carter's crime spree in California began with a rape and robbery of a woman in San Diego. Three days later, he did a similar assault on a woman in Ventura County. A few days after that, he showed up at Miss Kim's place of residence where he strangled her to death. The very next day, he went to Culver City, murdered Gillette Mills and Susan Knoll. The very next afternoon, he went to West Los Angeles and murdered Bonnie Guthrie. And the very next evening, he came to San Diego and murdered Janet Collins. He committed five murders in four separate counties over a 40 time period. And I don't know that that's ever happened before. Pippin used witness testimony and physical evidence recovered at the time of Carter's arrest to link him to each of the murdered women. He took from every one of his murder victims some personal property. He was arrested driving Gillette Mills's Phantom Z car. There was cameras belonging to Noel. There was a property belonging to Miss Kim. He was wearing a sweater that had been knitted by Bonnie Guthrie. Found in his pocket was a piece of paper with the words Shy Lass written on it. The other half of that piece of paper was found in Janet Collins' apartment. The PIN number for Jeanette Collins' ATM account was 749527, her secret code for shy lass. Authorities believe that Carter forced the number out of Collins, then strangled her. These and other items found in Carter's possession strengthened the prosecution's contention that he was a serial sexual predator. Based on studies of previous serial killers, it's not uncommon at all for them to take souvenirs the phenomenon, who can explain it? But Dean Carter made it awful easy to tie him to all five of the, the dead women. He knew every one of these women. All the victims in this case were listed in his phone book. He met women very easy, but after getting to know them, they tended to shy away from him. And they all kind of had the same feeling about him. They said they couldn't put their finger on it, but there was something just kind of strange. He couldn't handle rejection by the women. This woman that he'd been interested in basically rejected him. He couldn't handle it, and he just kind of lost it. To ensure a first-degree murder conviction, Jim Pippin had to prove that Jeanette Cullen's death was deliberate and not an accident of passion. In a strangulation death, it takes three to four minutes to kill somebody. People go unconscious in about a minute and a half, but the killer has to maintain constant pressure on their neck for another couple of minutes. During the trial, we stopped and nobody said anything for three or four minutes and we just watched the clock go around. The jury clearly sees that, uh, that he had plenty of time to reflect. After more than nine weeks of testimony, dozens of witnesses and countless pieces of evidence, the jury was left to decide the fate of Dean Philip Carter. On August 10th, Dean Philip Carter was convicted of the first degree murder of Jeanette Collins. Jim Pippen, speaking on behalf of all of Carter's victims and their families, stood before the 12 jurors and argued for death. The victims were selected, not randomly, all nice young girls who rejected him. The jurors sit through these things and, and the system asks them to decide whether or not they should vote to execute somebody. 
I mean, that's a big decision that we ask ordinary folks from the community to come, come in and make. The jury deliberated for only three hours. As Jeanette Collins' parents looked on, Superior Court Judge Melinda Lassiter imposed sentence. That's count one that the defendant be sentenced to death. She has to swallow before she can say death. She'd never done that. She'd never imposed death penalty before on anybody. And that was a pretty dramatic moment in the courtroom. There was some silence after that. Dean Philip Carter is currently awaiting execution at San Quentin State Prison. For the investigators and prosecutors, his fate was the only just verdict. His victims were all just purely innocent people. Not even the prime of their life yet. They were all in their early 20s and they had their whole lives ahead of them. He caused a lot of grief from Oakland to San Diego. And um, I think he's got exactly what he deserved. It's a strange feeling that, that the prosecutors have after um, going through a trial like this and seeing the damage somebody's done to, to other people and the families. And you, I mean, what you're trying to do is hold them responsible and, and get the system to impose the appropriate punishment. I mean, there's a sense of satisfaction that you did all you could within the rules to make it right, but there aren't any winners in these kinds of proceedings. The long and agonizing legal process of bringing Dean Philip Carter to trial ultimately resulted in landmark legislation. The California State Senate adopted the Victim's Bill of Rights, ensuring that in the future, killers like Carter will swiftly be brought to justice.